Hello, everyone. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Um, I heard somebody clip in and clip out. Um, but uh, could I get your guys's PSUIDs, the letters, and then the numbers? Um, and get the same one that your email is, just so that I can take attendance and send that in to my bosses. Um, and then we can get started. Um, and we did indeed do sections 2.4, 2.5, and the chapter two focus on theory today or this week, correct? Yes. Awesome. Okay. Um, I am still waiting on a copy of the sixth edition. Uh, so we are just going to roll through same type of stuff that we did last week. Um, talking about the second derivative, um, marginal cost, marginal revenue, and then a little bit about limits. So that is, yes, limits. I'm not confused. Um, all right, let's just dive right in for 2.4. Okay, um, we are going to start with problem two. It may or may not be the same, but I'm going to draw it out. I'll leave the line though. Um, where we have a function that looks something like this. And on that function, we have a series of points. Um, and our goal is to identify where dy dx and d squared y dx squared are both negative. Um, so I think that instead of just finding out where they're both negative, we should maybe find out what the signs of dy dx and d, uh, y squared or d squared y uh, dx squared are for all of these. Um, so the way that I would recommend starting this problem is to begin with first derivatives, identify where those are positive and negative, and then separate them out into second derivatives. So um, I'll ask you guys, where are the first derivatives positive? Do you want us to write it or just tell you? Um, you can do whatever. If you are comfortable on the audio, then just tell me. Um, we have B and C in the chat too. So at exactly point B and point C. Um, and then when is it negative? Point A, yep, and E. Then what's happening at point D? Zeros? Yep. And that's point D. Okie doke. Um, now let's think about the second derivative. Where is the second derivative going to be positive? Would it be from A and C? Just A and C? Correct. That's my answer. OK. Um, we have in the chat A and B. What do you think the difference is between those two? 
uh, A is negative and B is positive? The first derivative. Yes. So um, we're looking at the second derivative now. Um, the first derivative, we look at slope, right? We look at, is this line trending downward as x increases, or is it trending upward? What would be the line, the slope of the line tangent to the curve at this point? If we're looking at a graph and we're thinking about the second derivative, we're actually going to be thinking about concavity. So is it going to be concave up or concave down? So knowing that a positive second derivative is going to be concave up, it is, yes, it's going to be A and B. As a positive second derivative. What about negative second derivative? C and E, yes. Both of those are negative. What about D? Why do you think it's zero? The tangent line is flat. It has no slope. That is true. And that means that the first derivative is going to be zero. But if the first derivative is zero, does that mean that the second derivative is zero? What do we look for in the graph for second derivative? Uh, concavity, so it looks like it would be concave down. Yep. Could I ask a question about concavity when you get done? For sure. Go ahead. Um, with the points on the line, where do we find the concavity from what to what? Because it, it um, I'm not sure how far left and right to go of the point to determine concavity. That's a really good question. Um, so Mostly you just kind of eyeball it. Um, the way I kind of like to envision it is like if it's like a cup and I were to like fill it with water, would the water like stay in the cup and like pool on the bottom? So like if I were to pour water in here, it would pool here and I, you know, if I were to pour water in here, it would all come out, right? So then I've got concave up and concave down. Um, but what about here? I mean like if I were to pour water in here, it would obviously all stay in. But the idea is, is that there's a point about, usually about halfway between these. They don't get close enough. Like they won't ask you like if I have point F here, they won't ask you if it's concave up or concave down at F because it's too close to the switch. Um, but usually it's about halfway between the minimum and the maximum or the maximum and the minimum. Because clear here, it's clearly concave down. And here, it's clearly concave up. And so this is about where they divide it. And the idea is, is that um, this point that I did in gray, not point F, um, but that line, um, is actually, it has a name. It's called the inflection point. And it's the point at which we move from being concave down into concave up. And the principle behind a second derivative is that you have a rate of change of a rate of change, if that makes sense. So our first derivative is going to be slope. So if we think about this as slope, we start off, for instance, with something that is more negative here, and then it gets less negative, and then we have a a point where the, the slope is zero, and then the slope is slightly more positive, and then it's more positive, and then at this point, it is going to be the most positive. Right? Because after this point, it starts getting smaller, less positive rather. And then we get to the point where it is zero. And then it is negative. And then over here, it would be even more negative. 
Does that kind of make sense? I've kind of... Yes. Um, okay. Thank you. Well, the next like part of this is to say these lines down here, this is becoming less and less negative. What's a word for less negative? More positive, right? So starting from here, it's less negative, less negative, rather more positive, more positive, more positive, more positive, zero. More positive, more positive, more positive, more positive, more positive. The most positive. So it's all increasing. The slope from this point to this point is increasing. The rate of change of the slope is positive. So that means that our second derivative. And then at the point where it's the most positive, it starts coming back down. So it's less, 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 less positive. We reach zero. It keeps getting less positive. It becomes negative and becomes more negative. And so from this point to this point, the slope becomes more negative. So the rate of change is negative of the slope. So this is a rate of change of a rate of change, which is our second rate. Okay, so that's kind of how you tell. Um, there is a point, it's called the inflection point. You will be able to find it at some point in time. Um, but for now, just trust that they're not gonna put a question with like F is like very near the inflection point, but not exactly. Um, and it's not always about halfway. Like sometimes it depends on the curve, but I usually do halfway between like min and max as a good kind of estimate if you're just looking at a graph. Okay. Um, all right, any questions about this question? Nope. Sweet. We are going to try to do a couple more problems. Um, let's do, I'm going to do these two to start with. And This is problem five, but it's very thin, it's a very thin line. This is problem five, um, again, in the fifth edition, this is problem six. Um, this is one and one, and again, one and one. So for these problems, we are going to give the signs, so just say if it's positive, negative, or zero, um, of both the first derivative and the second derivative. And I think that graphing these would be useful. So starting with this, these two, the first derivative, we can sketch out a graph for it. What is the first derivative graph going to look like? Zero, exactly. Okay, and we know that. We know that this slope is not changing. 
What does that say then about our second derivative? It's also zero. And the reason it's zero is because there, if you remember, we had a point in time in the last question where our first derivative was zero, but our second derivative was not zero. And that was because the slope was changing. But here, um, the slope is not changing. The slope is zero at all times, um, at all values for x. Um, and another reason why I think it's useful to graph this is because if this is the graph of y prime, we can very easily see we, all we need to do here to find the derivative, the second derivative, is to take the derivative of y prime. And we know that this graph slope is not changing. So it's also easy. What about problem six? Yes, so it's going to be negative. Um, What is the graph of this going to look like? Like if I were to graph this, you know that dy dx is negative. Yes, and it's going to be a flat line somewhere below x, uh, below zero. I think. So it's gonna look something like this. So this is the y prime graph. Right? So what does that tell us about the second derivative? Zero. because we can tell by looking at this first one, this is y, there's no concavity here, it's not concave up, it's not concave down, um, thus we're not going to have a second derivative. And then we can also tell by looking at the graph of the first derivative, we can see that the slope here is not changing, it is constant, and thus we are going to have a second derivative of zero. The idea being in that this graph, we're looking for concavity. And in this graph, we're looking for derivative of y prime. Um, y prime graph. Okay. Let's do something just a little bit different. Question seven is going to look like this. And I'm gonna do my best to draw this one. So it looks a little something like that. First derivative, what are we thinking? Negative, yes. Second derivative, what are we thinking? Positive. Yes. Why is that? Because of its concavity? Yes. It is concave up. Another way to think about it is that we started off we were very negative. We got less and less and less and less and less negative in our slope as time goes on. And therefore, it is becoming a more positive slope. Our, the rate of change of our slope is going to be positive. Therefore, a second derivative is positive. Awesome. Okay. Um, Let's do, um, do you guys have your books with you? I do. Um, can you check problem 28 
or just look around for um, a particle moving along the x-axis as a function of time. 28 for me is winning on the war on poverty. So you're looking for a particle for a function of time? Yeah. Um, it'll be a little bit after that, maybe, because that's my 25. So each of the graphs in the figure shows the position of a particle moving along the x-axis yeah. as a function of time. I've got it. Do you want me to send it to you? Um, it should be the same. There are four graphs beneath it. I doubt it changed all that much. I just want to make sure that you have something to look at as I like throw it up on the board. Yeah. Awesome. What number is it in your book? It is 32 for the okay. sixth edition. Um, okay. So we have a series of graphs here. We have a particle moving along the x-axis as a function of time. This is position. Um, I'm going to call this function x of t. Um, it's also sometimes called s of t. Um, have we talked about velocity acceleration yet? I don't believe so, but I'm not okay. sure. Um, this is a physics type thing, actually. Kinematics. Um, and this is a favorite thing to throw at students because a lot of times people, like, you'll notice this question is not saying, like, what is the first derivative? What is the second derivative? Like, talk to me about that type of stuff. It goes right into, you have a position graph, a particle position graph, and it asks you about velocity and acceleration. So it's important that you guys remember the relationship between these functions. Um, x of t is position. Um, sometimes it's like distance. It's basically a single like, you're measuring it essentially in like meters or centimeters or something like that. Um, the derivative of this with respect to time, the rate of change in position is V of T, velocity. So we can call this in meters, and this is going to be in meters per second, right, in terms of our units. If we take the derivative of something that is in units of meters and we take the derivative with respect to time, we end up in meters per second. Then, if we take the derivative of that, we end up with I didn't spell that right. I did spell that right. Um, Spelling is not my forte, um, which is in units of meters per second squared. So this is a physics thing, um, but it is important to remember uh, that velocity is the first derivative of position, and acceleration is the second derivative of position and is the derivative of velocity. And that's the information we're going to need to answer this problem. So we have a series of four graphs. I'm gonna sketch them out right now. Um, they're not gonna be super pretty, but they're gonna work. One that looks like that. One that looks like this. One that looks like this. And I have one that looks like this. Okay. 
tell me if these graphs are not the same ones that you have. They're the same, awesome. And then this is x of t, like that. So um, during this time interval, which particle has constant velocity? Now the question is, what does constant velocity mean? It's exactly the same, it's consistent, it doesn't change. Yes. So the rate of change is going to be the same. The first derivative, oh, yes, of course, I'm sorry. This is one. This is four. This is three. And this is two. Right? Yeah. No. I screwed it up. That is one. And this is two. Okay, so yes, we're looking for something where the first derivative is constant. And that means that we're looking for something where the slope is constant. So that would be number four. For part B, where is the greatest initial velocity? What does that mean? Would it be three? Because it's got the highest slope? Yes. So we're looking for the highest initial slope. That's graph three. Um, for part C, we're looking for the greatest average velocity. One for greatest average? Yep, I'm sorry, I have a notification that is just not going away. There we go. Um, so now I can use this space. Slope, and that is going to be number one. Um, D, now we're looking for a zero average velocity. Could you explain what that means? Um, actually, it's not going to be one for, number, for C, right? It's actually going to be two because I switched the labels on you guys. Um, so the idea is, is that um, <clears throat> The average velocity is going to be like, say, we are looking at a graph of number four's velocity, okay? And we can see that it looks something like this, right? So the average velocity is going to be some negative number. Now let's look at like a graph of this velocity up here. It starts off approximately zero, and then it's less positive, and then it's more positive, and then it's more positive, right? So the average velocity here is going from, for instance, zero to five, is going to be the average of um, all of these velocities in between here. Or because we think about averages as lines, it'll be a line like this. Does that make sense? Yeah. So for instance, over here, we would have our average velocity is a line. So we start on velocity is equal to zero. We go to where our velocity is equal to five. Our average velocity is going to be like this, right? Or actually, why don't we just line on the first one? It's an average rate of change. 
our average, we don't need to think about it in terms of graphing out the derivatives. We can just say this is our average rate of change right here from zero to five, from zero to five. Now from zero to five, you can see that we have a positive velocity and then we have, uh, we have positive velocity from here to here. We have a negative velocity and then we have back to a positive velocity and it all averages out to be zero. Does that make sense? Sorry, I added that extra step in there when you didn't need it. All right, um, zero acceleration. So what the question here is, is which of these graphs has no second derivative? Exactly right, didn't need the question mark, you nailed it, it's four. This graph here, if I can get my pen back, this graph here has no acceleration. It doesn't have a second derivative, or rather its second derivative is equal to zero because it has no concavity. Now positive acceleration throughout. Is it going to be three? It's going to be two. Yep, because positive acceleration, this is f, Pause acceleration means a positive second derivative means concave up all the time. This is concave up all the time. This has a concave down and concave up portion, and this is concave down the whole time. So our answer is gonna be two again. Could you run over that one more time, um, just quickly, the positive acceleration because it's concave up? Yes, okay. Think about it in like, in our train of logic is going to go, I'll erase this a little bit. Our train of logic is basically going to go like this. We are looking for something that has positive acceleration throughout the entire graph. So, what that means is that we want something that has positive acceleration from x is equal to zero to x is equal to five, or t rather, t is equal to zero to t is equal to five, right? Positive acceleration throughout. So to translate that, we're going to say a positive second derivative throughout. Does that make sense? Can we make that jump? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Because we said that our acceleration is going to be our second derivative of this initial graph that we have. Then we can say that this means it is concave up that. And that's how we get from what they give us in the problem to how we solve it. And then it comes down to the question of where is it concave up throughout? We know it's concave down in number three. It's both down and up in number one, and it's up in number two. The answer is going to be number two. Awesome. Okay. Um, I don't want to run out of time today, so um, I do. I really want to get through our focus on theory. So easy breezy. Let's go through section two point five if you guys are ready. And. 
yeah. Um, stop me again if you have any questions about what we just did, but otherwise, let's move on. Um, let's start, um, I have, this is question eight, where we are given a graph, we are given a revenue function, and then we are given a cost function. And this is dollars versus products. We're also given two points on this graph. This is uh, the first quantity we're selling and this is the second quantity that we're selling. So um, we have this graph, we have part of this graph, we have the part that we're gonna use um, and we are asked which has the greater, which is greater, marginal cost or marginal revenue at Q is equal to one. Or rather Q one. Thoughts. Cost a Q1? The marginal cost. So we know that C of Q1 is going to be greater than R of Q1, right? Because this is just a greater number. But then the question becomes marginal cost. What is the rate of change of the cost at each of these points? So I, this is a true statement, but this is not the question that we're asking. I like to write these as C prime at the point and R prime at the point, because for me at least, that tells me more about what I'm looking at. Why do you say marginal revenue? Because it has a greater rate of change. Exactly. The rate of change of R at Q1 is greater than the rate of change of C at Q1. Rate of change meaning slope, right? So we started off with marginal cost. This is kind of like a train of logic here. We started off, they said, which is greater, marginal cost or marginal revenue? We know that both of those are the derivatives of their respective things. So we said that this is C prime of Q1 and R prime of Q1. Then we said, what is a derivative? It's a rate of change, it's a slope. So which of these two has the greater slope? And the answer is the revenue graph. Does that make sense? Awesome. Now the question is, what about Q2? Q2 is going to be right here instead, so it exists on the revenue graph. Again, MR, same reason. The slope doesn't change. It's a line, the slope is constant, the rate of change is constant, the derivative is constant. 
So what does that tell us? It means that for every one more item we sell, our gain in revenue is going to be less than, or rather our gain in revenue is going to be greater than our gain in cost. So like, yes, our cost increases, increases when we purchase another thing, but our revenue is also going to be increasing and the rate of change at which it increases is going to be greater. Any questions about this? No, I'm going to do another one of these types of questions. Um, this in my book is question 12. Um, when we're done with this question, I have two questions about the quiz that we took. There's a certain, like, true-false word problems that I was a little confused about. Okay, doke. Um, if you can get a screenshot of those, that would be great, um, because I don't have access to that. So, okay. um, yes. So again, we have C of Q, we have R of Q. Um, this is, do you guys see this graph hanging out in your book, maybe around problem 12? Um, because there are lines in this graph that have numbers in them. It's uh, 14 in the version I have. Okay. So um, we have here cost and revenue functions for a charter bus company. Should the company add a 50th bus, how about a 90th? Explain your answers using marginal revenue and marginal cost. I'm gonna mark out where our 50th is. So our 50th bus is gonna hang out right about here. That's 50 buses. Uh, do, 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 straight up. It's not a very straight line, but you get point. And here is going to be our, I guess here's our hundredth bus right here. So our hundredth kind of goes up like this. Oh, number 14 is not about the buses. It, is it just like a similar looking problem to this or? It, it does look similar. But, but it's, it's not the same. It says okay. cost and revenue for production. Is a company making money or losing money? Okay. A similar question. Um, I think we're, let's just do what I have here, um, which I can outline. Um, the idea being that you don't really need a lot of this graph. Um, I just looked a little further. I'm sorry. Uh, number 15 says cost and revenue. No, you're fine. Uh, 50th bus, 90th bus, and explain your answer. Okay, so what number was that? This one is 15. 15. Okay. So here we have a graph. Um, we have the idea being we have 49 buses. Should we add a 50th bus and why? Does anyone have any thoughts on this? Uh, 
uh, would it be where the the marginal revenue meets the marginal cost at the very top, uh, top right? Well, not quite. Um, so the idea is, is that our Q is our buses, right? That's buses is only spelled with one S. Um, so we're hanging out right here at 49. Should we add 50 buses? Like add an additional bus so that we get up to 50 buses? That's kind of the question. So like what's the difference between this point and this point? We have two yeses in the chat. Why do you think that? The revenue is still greater than the cost, so that's important. But what we really want to look at is that marginal revenue is higher than marginal cost. Exactly. Is it, is it because of the slope of marginal cost is getting less at that point? Yes. So the slope of marginal cost is very, very little. We're not like, it's not going to cost us a lot to add an additional bus but we are gonna gain a lot of revenue. The slope for our revenue graph is larger than the slope for our cost graph. It is a good investment to continue like this because if we think about it in terms of, um, if I add one but, like if we think about profit, right, as being revenue plus cost, revenue minus cost, right? Profit is equal to revenue minus cost. We're all okay saying this? Then we could say that marginal profit is equal to marginal revenue minus marginal cost. And what we want is a positive marginal profit. Because if we have a negative marginal profit, it means our profits are going down by adding an additional bus. But a positive marginal profit indicates that our profit is going up if we add a bus. Thus, we want to make sure that our marginal revenue is greater than our marginal cost so that marginal revenue minus marginal cost is greater than zero. Everybody cool with that? Yes. Awesome. Let's think about a 90th bus. So if our 90s hanging out about here-ish, what are we thinking? Why? Why now? Exactly. The rate of change for cost, the marginal cost, is greater than the rate of change for re revenue. Thus, marginal revenue minus marginal cost is going to be less than zero. Thus, marginal profit less than zero. Thus, we lose money. We lose profit. Profit decreases by adding a 90. And the reason being is that if we have a profit function and marginal profit functions in the same way as marginal revenue and marginal cost. The idea is if we add one more, is our 
profit going to go up, i.e. do we have a positive marginal profit, or is our profit going to go down, a negative? And in this case, our marginal profit would be negative, and thus it would not be helpful to purchase the 90 plus. Okie doke. Does anyone have any questions regarding marginal cost, marginal revenue? Slash, did you find screenshots of the quiz? I did send you an email with oh. the pictures of the two, FYI. Okay. Let me check my email really quick then. I think the reason why I'm so confused is the explanation that they gave us. I just, because it just says uh, f of t is less than zero on the interval, then f prime of t is decreasing on that interval. I guess you can't really tell that. I guess I was going with negative in my brain. Um, I'm going to stop sharing really quick and we're going to swap over. To... Can you see this? Yes. Okay. So for a function f of t, the second derivative, f double prime of t, is less than zero. It is negative. Um, then the derivative is decreasing. Okay. I the way I, I the way I was looking at it for me f double prime just means it's concave down. So you can't determine whether or not it's decreasing or increasing. So that's where I got confused. Cuz on it could be a parabola so half would be increasing theoretically the other half would be decreasing. Um Somebody popped up in the chat, but I lost the chat box. All I can see is the notification for the chat box. Um, oh, you there it is. Answered true as well. But, but yes. All, so that's why I'm confused. Yeah. Okay. This is actually a really good distinction to make. Um, so the idea is is that we're looking. That's a really thin line. Can I get a thicker one? Nope. Um. Let me know if you can't see this, I guess. But the idea is, is that you have a graph, right? Like, let's talk about the graph that we were looking at earlier today. It looks like this. Um, but the question is not, is the function decreasing, right? Because we, here we have a portion of the function that is increasing and a portion of the function that is decreasing. But the question is, is the derivative increasing or decreasing? So if we were to divvy this up, not in the way that I just did, but into from here to here, our function, which I'm going to call f of t, is increasing or decreasing rather, excuse me, decreasing. And then this next step from here to here, it is increasing, correct? And then from here to here, it is decreasing again. Does that make sense? Yeah. This is our original function. But now we need to ask the question about our first derivative, 
our first derivative f prime of t, our first derivative is doing what in this first chunk here? From here to here, it is increasing or decreasing. Conceptually speaking, we are starting at a point where it is more negative and ending at a point where it is less negative. Decreasing. Which one did you just say? Sorry. Start decreasing. Starting from more negative and going to less negative. Like the difference between starting at like a minus 10, a slope of minus 10, and ending at a slope of minus 1. Now you've really lost me because though the, with the with that one I always thought it was whether it was the slope would have been okay I guess it's positive. yeah the slope is negative okay negative, this is it, yeah um the slope yeah let's I think I'm kind of I I'm worried that I'm confusing you more than I should be so let's just look at where where the slope is I guess um, let me erase some of this. Um, okay, so we s the slope is negative from here to here, right? The slope is positive from here to here. That means that what I just wrote down here, this f of t, that's wrong. It's f prime of t. Because what I did, this whole thing, f of t is positive this whole time, right? f of t is always above the f-axis. Yes. What I wrote down here was not f of t, but f prime of t, because we said that it's negative until it hits zero, zero, positive until it hits zero again, or derivative, and then it's negative again. You can see that, yeah? Um, so that might be better. So. Um, back to kind of what I was talking about before, is now we're not going to look at the derivative itself, because we said that this, this derivative in this section here, this little red section, is going to be negative. We established that. We know it's a negative derivative. But how is it changing? It starts off with a slope like that and then ends with a slope like this, and then like this, right? So it's more negative, less negative, zero. And does that represent an increase or a decrease? That would be an increase because you're going to less negative, to zero. Yes. Um, there's the way that we kind of use that language, more negative, um, more negative to less negative. You could say instead of less negative, you could say more positive, and therefore it's an increase, and it might be easier to think about it that way. Okay, so um, the word decreasing in the question doesn't actually have to do with decreasing well like it's going from like 10 down to 2 it has to do with the slope itself yes is the slope like what I meant with the 10 and the 2 is that if the slope of this green thing is minus 10 right it's a steep negative slope and then the slope of this like lime thing here is m is equal to negative 2 it's a less negative slope and then suddenly with this, I, I don't even know what color this is, flex, it's zero. Right? So we start with like a more negative slope. I thought maybe the numbers would help. I don't think they really did. But that's why I threw them in there. It's because we start with a very negative and then it, it's less negative and then it's zero. So the idea is behind this question is not, <clears throat> um, the 
like, is the derivative negative or positive? What it's asking is, is the derivative decreasing? Or if we think about that, what is the rate of change of the derivative? Increasing or decreasing? And the answer is, is that if it is a negative second derivative, it means that we're decreasing. And we can see that actually in this exact same graph that I drew, um, because right here is kind of the point where we go from concave up to concave down, right? And so we start here with a very positive derivative. I'm gonna represent that by three plus signs. And then if I go up here, it's less positive. So it's only two plus signs. And then it's less positive. So it's only one plus sign, but it's still positive. But throughout this whole process, it is becoming more negative slash less positive. We hit zero. then it's one negative sign. It's sort of negative. It's like just coming off of zero negative. Then it's a little bit more negative. And then it's even more negative. And here too, it is becoming more negative. So this chunk here to this chunk is all the derivative decreasing because we start at positive three positive signs and we end at three negative signs, right? We start very positive and we end very negative. It's just the process of going through that zero point is really wonky. So it's asking for just the second part of the, where it's concave down, it's just asking from the, the last part of it of what the derivative is decreasing? Yeah, so this graph that I drew here, um, oh dear, that's what happened, okay. This graph that I drew here, um, do, do, do. go away. Um, oh, that's just a box. The graph that you would be looking at would look something along these lines. Well, and your explanation of this actually answers explains the other the other picture I sent you because the other picture has to do with the same concept. Okay. Yeah, it's really tough. Um, because like you look at the that, this question, if for a function f of t, the second derivative is negative, then the derivative is decreasing. And it's just not intuitive. But the idea is, is that second derivative rate of change of a rate of change First derivative decreasing describes the rate of change of the first derivative, so therefore they are the same thing. <clears throat> okay, any questions, comments, or concerns? I can pull up the second question if you would like me to. Or we can talk a little bit about the focus on theory. You don't have to pull up the other question because it's it literally the, the same thing as this, it's just the opposite as opposed to you going with uh, f double prime to f prime, it's just uh, just asking about the function and then what's f prime and decreasing and it's, you can't answer that question is what it is essentially. Okay. Okay, dope. Um, let's do a couple problems from the focus on theory real quick then. Um, it's gonna be bye bye to the sharing.
and you should be able to see the whiteboard. And I'm going to try to find the chat box again because it went missing. Um, all right. Let's think about, I think the most important part of this is actually going to be question one, which I hope is the same. And it basically gives you a, um, a graph and asks you to mark off all of the different pieces of a derivative. Um, which seems very tedious and it is, but the concept is really important. Um, so, which one are you on? This is my question one. For what section? Uh, for the focus on theory. And it asks you to find um, a series of different things. Here is, for instance, H. This is X. This is, this is a function F of X. That's not H, that's A. A. Um, and then part A is asking you to mark out A plus H. And then part B is H. Um, part C is F of A. Part D is F of A plus H. Do you guys have a problem that looks similar to this? That's what it shows in my book. Awesome. So I kind of set this up in a way to color code this. Um, a plus H, where are we adding our H? If we're adding it to A, where am I going to put A plus H on this? Assuming H is a positive number. This is basically an increase on the x-axis. So what I'm saying is that I have x is equal to a, and now x is going to be equal to a plus h. If I label that point where it is, what is h? Any ideas? It is like about double kind of what we had before. I don't know if that's what you're trying to say. Um, but really this, this distance I placed it at is arbitrary. It doesn't matter where I put it. A plus H could be like way over here. Um, I just put it there here to be more clear about what I'm doing. Um, the distance between these two is H. For instance, A plus H minus A. So if I have this distance minus this distance, I'm left with the distance between them, right? Does that make sense? 
and that is equal to h. Can you say that again? Um, the idea is, is that h is some number that we are adding to a on the x-axis, correct? Okay. Thus, we end up with the point a plus h. So a is some number, h is some number. Then the distance between a and a plus h is going to be h, because if this distance is from zero to a plus h, this distance is a plus h. And then this distance from zero to a is a. Then to find the distance between them, we would say a plus h minus a, right? So really we're thinking about this less as this is point a and more of this is a distance from zero, x is equal to zero. Thus, the distance between these two points is h. Okay, so we have h. What is f of a? No idea. It's okay. Think about this like literally in its most basic form. F of A. We graph the point on the F of X graph where F X is equal to A. So it'd be Y something? Yep. So this is the point F of A. For instance, if I don't know, if we had one over here and we wanted to find f of one, we would just plug one into this graph and it would spit out a point right there, right? So that is where the graph f of x is when x is equal to a. Problems, comments, concerns. That makes total sense. Awesome. F of A plus H. It's the same thing. Same thing. Same but for F A plus H. You clicked out there, but I heard the first half of it, and I'm pretty sure that you are right. Sorry. So. I would it's same thing, but for a plus h. Yep. So here is the point f of a plus h. And so, like the point wise, we could like pick out a point and say like, oh, um, this point is um, actually instead of doing this, this point is rather a plus h. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm so sorry. <clears throat> this point is in the form x comma y, right? We have an ordered pair. And so this is actually going to be a, f of a, if that makes sense. So I did, wasn't quite great there. So the y value there is f of a. And the y value here is f of a plus h. Are we cool with what I just did and fixing my mistake in the previous section? Could you just run over E really quick one more time? Sorry. E? Is everyone cool with D, C, B, and A right now? Okay. So E, if I have f of a plus h, and that is a distance on the y-axis, right? And I have f of a, which is a distance on the y-axis, then f of a plus h is here, this whole thing, and f of a is here, and it's this chunk. Which, where can I label what one is minus the other? This is very similar to what we just did down here, where we had a plus h minus a. 
to get the distance between them. Yes, this distance here. Because as we said, we are, we're calling this, um, we're saying that f of a and f of a plus h both represent things on the y-axis. They are vertical distances, distances because we have these points that are we ordered in the way such that a, f of a, here's our x value, here's our y value, a plus h, f of a plus h, here's our x value is a plus h, our y value is going to be f of a plus h, it's over here, the distance between them is going to be f of a plus h minus f of a, like that, like so. Are we okay? Yeah, that makes complete sense. Awesome. I am going to put these together now because what we're looking for is f of a plus h minus f of a over h, which seems like a lot, but we just put, we, we have all of these pieces now. I have them in the green and in the red. h is this distance. f of a plus h is this distance, f of a plus h minus f of a, excuse me. So change in y divided by change in x is is the slope. And it looks like that. So the idea here is that we just showed what a derivative is by hand, right? Because what a derivative is, is essentially a change in y, the line is still not, a change in y over a change in x, and the idea is, is as we discuss in this focus on theory, we're taking a limit. We're saying, how close can I get h to zero? So instead of having it look like this, I'm going to draw it in, um, I think this purple color is noticeable. Um, I'm going to say that I have f of a here, and then, or the of a here and then f of a plus h is here instead and then I'm going to draw the slope between these points because I'll have h and I'll have f of a plus h minus f of a right and then I'm going to make it even smaller I'm going to make it so they're like almost right on top of each other we're going to say that h is approaching zero and thus, my line is approaching the line tangent to the curve at that point. Does that make sense? The whole goal of this section um, is to think about derivatives in their like limit sense. And limits are hard for you guys because you just got introduced to them this chapter and you don't, it's, they're a difficult concept to think about. But in principle, what we're saying is that we want A to, or H to get as close to zero as we possibly can. We want A plus H to be all the way over here. So that H is really small. And the reason that we want that is because we don't want to make estimates. We, we talked about this earlier. We said that lines represent average rates of change, right? We can draw a line between two points and say that the slope is going to be the average rate of change. So if we're only changing a little bit at a time, then like so small that it's practically nothing, 
then we can get an instantaneous rate of change. And that's kind of the takeaway here. Does anyone have any questions? I know this is a lot to process. This is one of my favorite problems to do in this section because it really brings this whole why we're doing this thing together. Um, Could you explain the limit really quick one more time? That's where I got lost. I think I understood everything else. Okay. So we have something called a limit where H is approaching zero. And the definition of a derivative algebraically is this, okay? F of A plus H minus F of A over H, where H is approaching zero. This is A derivative. And the reason that is, is because this, as we just described, this chunk here, says what if we took the slope between two points on a line? right? And then we get to this part here, which is to say, what if those points were very, very close? Because as we defined, h is over here, h is this distance between the distance on the x-axis. So if we make them really close together, we get a better approximation of the curve. And one way, I'm going to erase it a little bit here, because I think that we got the principle of what we did. Um, but one way that we can think about this is that what if I had points here and here versus here versus here versus here. Which of these points would give me a better estimation of what's happening in this graph? Well, here is the slope between these two points. That's a rate of change. It gets me from point A to point B. But you can see that this line doesn't match up with the graph. And it's similar for these points. They continually get closer and closer and closer to the graph. They're behaving more like what the graph is doing. We get to here, and it's the best approximation so far. The closer the, point, the two points are together on the graph, the better the approximation of what is actually happening with the slope of that graph can be based off of um, the slope between these two points. So what the limit is saying is that what if we made h get really, really small, which means that these points are really, really close together. What is the slope between these two points? It's basically the line tangent to the curve, which is our derivative. Does that clear it up a little bit for you? So it's saying that the limit of h goes to closer to zero, which just means zero is the closest point between two points? Um, did they talk about the focus on theory in like the lecture section? Limits are like, ooh, they're weird. They're like a type of, I don't want to say they're a type of function because they're kind of not. But basically they're saying, what if h got really close but not equal to zero? what would happen here. Yeah, they did. And then the interesting case versus the uninteresting case and plugging okay. in the number for... Uh, yeah. So that's basically what we're doing here. But this is a very special one because it is the definition of a derivative. Okay. Um, I have five minutes before my next GSG starts. I did not plan this out well. I maybe should have put two hours between sessions. Um, do we have any other questions regarding this?
because I'm more than happy to wrap, make sure that you guys are all comfortable with the problem that we just did. I just really want to make sure that you guys have a solid like grasp of the graph that we just made and the connection between the graphs and the algebra that you are going to do next week. I understood this. There's just one problem that I didn't understand from um, the text, which I could probably go to the tutor for. Okay. Um, yeah. Which, okay. Shoot. I really should have. Um, yeah, you might have to. Um, if you can't get a tutor, then email me and I will work through it and or might just like hop in a Zoom room with you um, if you can't get a tutor when you need it by. So I don't really know how the online tutoring like one-on-one -on -one works, but I'll set up an extra session if you can't get an online tutor. All right, cool, thank you very much. For sure. Any other questions, comments, or concerns with this question slash material? Awesome. Thank you guys so much for coming. Um, I hope you have a wonderful week. Um, and yeah, have a great evening, guys. Thank you. Thank you.